right. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about uh, bearings and lubrications. Basically going to be an intro, talk about some of the different lubrication types, uh, different bearing types and bearing materials, and then go through an example for uh, journal bearings. Uh, bearing is uh, pretty simply defined. It's, it's when you have two objects that are in contact with each other. Um, it could be a sleeve around a round shaft or a slider on a flat surface. Those are plane bearings, uh, basically just two, two objects that have relative uh, uh, velocity between them that are in contact. Um, often one of the objects when we talk about bearings is a structural component. Usually it's a strong hard metal uh, that's part of the structure of the machine or something that transmits torque or a shaft or whatever. And then the other object is the bearing component. Uh, usually this is a softer material um, that is intended to eventually wear out and it's commonly made from uh, bronze uh, babbitt metal uh, or there's uh, even polymer uh, bearings made out of Teflon, acetyl which is Delrin, uh, UHMW which is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene or other material. <clears throat> uh, radial bearing can be split axially um, to assemble it to the shaft on a shaft or a complete cylinder, and in that case, that bearing is, is referred to as a bushing. Uh, rolling air element bearings uh, are, have hardened steel balls or rollers between hardened steel raceways and provide low friction relative motion because they are rolling versus sliding. When we think about bearings in the traditional engineering sense, we're usually thinking about uh, rolling element bearings, which can be ball bearings or needle bearings. They can be uh, radial bearings or thrust bearings or many different uh, co uh, combinations with obviously uh, radial bearings and thrust bearings being the most common. But in the true definition of a bearing, a bearing is really any two materials that are in contact with each other that have relative uh, motion. Um, and bearings also include uh, bushings, which is a bearing surface around a uh, shaft. Um, bearings are usually uh, used in combination with lubricants, and that is because the uh, lubricant can shear, and we, we take advantage of that property because we want the lubricant material to shear, shear uh, easily between two surfaces. And so a successful uh, lubricant application will be one where the lubricant would be between the two surfaces and the lubricant itself would be the material that would that would shear and um, the relative velocity between those two uh, materials would cause uh, the fluid to shear and prevent uh, wear and increase the life of the object. Lubricants can be gases, liquids, or solids. Um, even um, you know, we have air bearings and we have uh, liquid lubricants. They're pretty much just incompressible fluids that have low shear strength. They can be oils or greases, which is just oil with uh, soap, essentially. Um, lubricants, they coat the inner surfaces to inhibit adhesion and adhesive wear between compatible metals. And so, uh, as a rule of thumb, you don't want to have uh, materials that are uh, compatible with one another, meaning that they have uh, uh, chemistry, if you would, or... Uh, surface compatibility, which means a surface can dissolve inside of another surface. And so in general, you would not want similar materials, which may seem counterintuitive as far as the definition of compatible uh, goes, but a compatible material is a material that would uh, basically um, diffuse into the other material or the surfaces would uh, bond to the other material. And so you really don't want materials that are compatible with each other to have uh, compatible bearings, even though it might sound a little bit confusing. Um, we talk about compatible metals. We don't want compatible metals for bearings, even though we want, even though the design would require compatibility, uh, the term is a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that with a review from the graph from the surfaces chapter. Uh, liquid, li liquid lubricants are the most common. Uh, with mineral oils being the most common of the liquid lubricants. Uh, solid lubricants uh, that you, you may have heard of, such as the graphite or whatever, 
They're used when liquids can't be contained or the temperatures are too high. And temperature is a big deal uh, when we talk about uh, lubrication. In fact, uh, we don't really cover temperature uh, in this overview lecture and its relationship in detail, but it is something that has to be um, considered. Um, gaseous bearings, such as air bearings, are used for extremely low friction applications and often for uh, precision machines um, because um, they can uh, provide almost uh, almost zero friction uh, surfaces, uh, but the loads and the pressures and everything has to be have to be controlled uh, carefully, and you can't have high loads uh, through the bearing surfaces because the air is compressible, um, and so they're used when you need precision uh, motion. Uh, but you don't necessarily have um, super high uh, forces. Um, and then we have uh, um, the fact that lubricants also serve to remove heat. Um, and the heat removal mechanism is a big deal for a lot of lubricants and has to do with how much lubric lubricant you put in an application as far as the volume and how you disperse it. And there's uh, a lot of information available um, to pick and select lubricants that's also beyond the scope of this introductory lecture. <clears throat> when we talk about liquid, liquid lubricants, they're mostly petroleum-based or synthetic oils. Uh, even though water is one of the oldest lubricants um, and is still sometimes used in general because it can cause uh, corrosion, um, and rust and oxidation, we typically don't use that with steel, but uh, it's still, it still can be used uh, for some applications. Uh, many commercial lubricant oils have contaminant additives, which react with the metal surface, and they, perform, they form a protective layer. And so um, for some li liquid lubricants, materials are added, and those materials will bond to this, the struck the uh, bearing materials and provide this protective layer. Uh, there's also something called EPE lubricants or extreme pressure lubricants. So they add fatty acids or other additives. They react with the metal surfaces to perform a protective layer. And that protective layer usually will even remain if the oil is squeezed out from high contact loads. And there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time to design uh, uh, specialty lubricants for a lot of applications. Uh, oils are classified by their viscosity, uh, which is essentially a measure of their resistance to shear, and additives. Um, solid lubricants, uh, such as graphite, molybdenum, disulfide, uh, these are low st stress materials as well uh, that can be added to the surface, often in uh, powder or binder form, or bound to the surface. And we also have other coatings, such as phosphides, phosphates, oxides, and sulfides that chemically or electrochemically are deposited on the surface. Okay, so usually these deposited materials, they can have a thin uh, layer, so they would wear out uh, over time. Extreme pressure, pressure additives provide continuous renewal of chemically induced uh, coatings. And that's the case where you put a... Um, uh, additive there so that essentially as the uh, material is uh, worn from the surface, it's actually uh, re-deposited from these additives that are in the material, that remain in the material. Uh, these are two tables from your books. These are some of the types of liquid and solid lubricants. Um, this is the most common one that we've talked about, which is a petroleum oil or mineral oil. Um, and <clears throat> they provide good lubrication for lots of application, but not necessarily uh, so good at high temperatures. There's polyglycols, which are good. Uh, they don't form the sludge on oxi oxidizing. They're used in brake fluid, and you see some other examples here of, of different types of uh, liquid lubricants. These are some of the type of uh, solid lubricants, graphite, um, and uh, Teflon, rubber, soft metal. Uh, these are solids that can be used uh, when you can't contain the liquid uh, or you have higher temperatures, okay? And 
as you can see, there's a lot of options when selecting a, a lubricant. We don't go into selecting the best lubricant, but you should be aware that there are many options. And if you're going through a design, you're going to have to uh, go through the process of uh, getting uh, probably support from a lubricant manufacturer or salesperson that would help uh, find the best lubricant for the application and the materials that you're using. Um, but it's good for now just to know that there's a lot of options out there. Uh, lubricants are classified based upon their viscosity. I'm sure you've heard of viscosity from your fluids class, and it's just the resistance uh, of a fluid to shear. Uh, it's inversely proportionate, proportional to temperature and directly proportional with pressure. So viscosity is expressed either as absolute vis viscosity or kinematic viscosity. Uh, we can't easily uh, measure absolute uh, viscosity, so we'll typically measure kinematic viscosity. And by knowledge of the density of the fluid, uh, we can get the absolute uh, viscosity. Um, the ratio of the absolute viscosity to the kinematic viscosity is the density of the fluid, and it's expressed in RANs uh, in the U.S. system, or micro, micro ran or pascal second or millipascal seconds. Uh, you may also see viscosity measured in terms of centipoise or CP, which is one uh, millipascal second. Um, kinematic viscosity is measured with a viscometer, uh, and it's converted to absolute viscosity by multiplying by the density at the test temperature. And two temperatures that are typically selected are 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Okay, the kinematic viscosity, which is measured usually in centimeters per second, and this unit is called a stoke um, or uh, centistokes. Okay. Um, some typical values of viscosity at 20 degrees C or 68 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or are 0.0179 centipoise or 0 0.0026 microren for air, 1 centipoise or 0.145 microren for water, 393 centipoise or 57 microren for SA30 engine oil. Uh, when oil is heated up, this viscosity drops dramatically, okay? And so we wouldn't just take the uh, room temperature viscosity, especially if we had a machine, because we know that the viscosity is going to drop significantly based on temperature for many fluids. And for the oil in a hot bearing, it usually, as the bearing heats up, the viscosity will drop uh, to one to five uh, micro ring. This is a temperature of some different uh, lubrication materials. Um, this is some, um, you see in the middle is the SAE engine oil. Uh, you may have be more familiar with that, like a 10W30 or something like that. Um, and on the bottom here, we have the temperature. And you can see that the viscosity values drop uh, significantly as a function of temperature. And so, in an application where we have a, a lubricant that's added, uh, we'd need to kind of know what sort of temperatures uh, you would reach at, at steady state or during operation to really understand and know what the in-service viscosity is going to be. And that's going to be uh, dependent on um, your application. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, when we talk about uh, lubrication of a material, there's three major types of lubrication that uh, we talk about, and that is the full film uh, lubrication, and that's where uh, the bearings are actually, um, the bearing materials, okay, are completely separated from each other uh, by the fluid, and those full film uh, lubrication mechanisms can be hydrostatic. That's where we're pumping a fluid, typically, so that we increase the fluid pressure between two plates um, to have uh, the uh, one one of the uh, bearing surfaces move relative to the other bearing surface. So you can pump fluid in there. That's how air bearing uh, works. 
Uh, then we have hydrodynamic. Uh, that's how the journal bearings work. Uh, when, once you start spinning the journal, you actually create something that's kind of like a hydroplane in a car, if you've ever driven on a wet surface at uh, speeds that are too high. Uh, you might have experienced uh, hi some hydroplaning where the wheel of the car will uh, jump up on the surface of the fluid. Um, that's a similar mechanism to hydrodynamic lubrication. That's the principle that we use for journal bearings. And then there's the elastro, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication, and that's what we see in gears. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, so those are the full film types of lubrication. These are desirable because we have the lubrication uh, material between the bearing surfaces. And then we have mixed film, uh, which is where we have some partial lubrication and some partial asperity contact between the surfaces. Uh, it's usually undesirable. Uh, because we don't really want two of the, the bearing uh, to be in contact um, with the um, other bearing surface in general because we don't want to, uh, we want to minimize wear. And then we have boundary lubrication where the surfaces are in contact. And this is usually due to an excessive load, surface roughness, or some other geometrical feature of the design that causes, that will cause adhesive and or abrasive wear. Okay, so when we talk about the types of lubrication in the bearings, these are the three types. We have full film, the mixed film, and boundary. Okay, hydrostatic lubrication is one of the full film lubrication mechanisms, and that's usually with a pressurized fluid that's pumped between two surfaces. It has very low coefficient of friction related to the shear uh, properties of the material or the viscosity of the material or the fluid between the two. Typically, this is like 0.002 to 0.010 uh, for the coefficient of friction. So you can see it's extremely low. Um, it's also used for air bearings. You can think uh, either air hockey or hovercraft, or these are air bearings are sometimes used in uh, precision machines like CMMs uh, for um, their uh, gantry axis as it moves uh, front and back on the table. Uh, and then we have hydrodynamic lubrication, which is another full of form of the full film lubrication. And this is used for journal bearings. And uh, you, you'll see these uh, uh, or shaft or sleeve bearings or shaft bearings, sometimes they're called. Uh, you'll see these sometimes in some larger machines that have really heavy loads. Um, they can have almost infinite life. They're actually a very fascinating, uh, uh, simple uh, design that's been around since the early 1900s. And what happens is you have uh, a, an out, outer bearing here. Usually it's stationary, but it can also be moving. And then you have a shaft that's inside. The load is on the shaft for the application. And so Initially, they're in contact with one another, and the reaction forces uh, for that shaft load are uh, through the bearing. And often this bearing surface is a softer material, like a babbit that's housed in a uh, more harder or structural material. And sometimes this bearing material is actually deposited uh, onto the structural uh, material or designed such a way that we can take it out. <clears throat> so um, some people call these sleeve bearings. You can buy them and and put them in your machine, but you have to keep them lubricated. And so that's done usually with grease or making sure that the shaft, the way that it's designed is that has a constant uh, supply of oil that can get in. Uh, the oil does come out of the, the sides. And so you have to make sure that you have a, a sufficient supply of oil to make sure that it never uh, runs out. And the way that it works is as the the um, shaft starts to rotate. Initially, it's in boundary lubrication where they're in contact with one another. And then the shaft <coughs> uh, becomes eccentric. And then we have this slight shift here as it tries to roll on the bearing surface. And then it'll slip, and we have some friction. And then when it does that, it pulls some fluid uh, under here as it rotates and actually acts like a pump and then 
if you can get up to speed uh, quickly enough, then you you create a pumping mechanism. And that pumping mechanism makes sure that there's a thin uh, film of fluid that's constantly preventing um, the shaft and the bearing from uh, contacting one another. And it follows this uh, case here for these types of uh, lubrication. You get down here. This is your friction coefficient. Initially, it's high. Then as you start to get some of the fluid in between the bearing and the journal, then uh, your friction drops considerably. And then it's just a function of velocity uh, here. And that's more of a property of the uh, lubricant that you're using. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, then we have elastohydrodynamic lubrication, and that's for th that's what you experience in like cam and follower, or gear and pinion, um, and that is where you have non-conforming surfaces, uh, such as gear teeth, or cam followers. <clears throat> so when you they're in contact with one another, uh, as we saw before, you're going to have a line contact um, at one point in the gear face, and then at uh, points away from that. Uh, center of contact, uh, there will be some uh, sliding. They say you can estimate, you know, something like 8 to 10 percent sliding between the surfaces. And when you have that line contact and that sliding, it actually squeezes the lubrication out at low speeds and can cause excessive wear. Um, these loads at the contact surfaces, they cause Hertzian stresses and local deflection and that creates a contact patch. And so although they're initially in line contact, uh, when the local uh, stresses are high enough, then it, it uh, flattens out that area and that actually can provide a flat enough surface uh, for full hydrodynamic film to develop if the relative velocity is high enough, okay? And so uh, there's, uh, again, a lot of details that would go into getting this right for your particular applications. Um, so, um, um, you can um, um, just kind of understand that this is a last or hydrodynamic lubrication. Uh, if you have high pressure, it'll actually increase the viscosity of the fluid. We saw that uh, the uh, viscosity is inversely proportional to temperature, but it's directly propor proportional to pressure. So when we get high contact stresses and high contact forces, actually uh, increases that viscosity of the uh, fluid. Um, so gear teeth and rolling element bearings, they can operate in all three modes of lubrication. They can experience boundary mixed filmed and full filmed uh, lubrication. Uh, cams uh, and followers, they usually operate in boundary lubrication uh, because this cam radius is typically so much smaller. Uh, and the mode of lubrication is usually developed, uh, determined by the film thickness to surface roughness ratio. Okay, So the rougher your surfaces are on your teeth and your cam and your follower, then the harder it is for you to achieve uh, um, better lubrication such as mixed film or full film lubrication. It's highly dependent on the surface roughness, which is highly dependent upon uh, how those components are manufactured. So as a rule of thumb, you do not want your surfaced roughness okay, to be no more uh, than, not think, but no more than one-third to half of the oil film thickness. okay. For uh, elastro elastohydrodynamic uh, lubrication, the film thickness is usually about one micron. So that means you would want to keep your surface roughness to be about uh, 0.3 to 0.5 microns. Okay. Uh, if you have increased relative visco velocity, the vol viscosity and the radius of curvature um, will affect the elastohydrodynamic uh, lubrication the most. Okay, so the viscosity and the geometry uh, will affect uh, the elastohydrodynamic properties the most. We don't we don't go into the design, but you should be aware that when you have gears or cams and followers that you're going to 
operate in some mixed regime and you need to um, select uh, you know lubricant and get support for that design process okay so uh, when we have boundary lubrication which is here uh, there's always some surface to surface contact the friction is usually constant because it's sliding friction uh, this is boundary lubrication is usually caused by the specific geometry high loads low velocity or not enough lubrication uh, it's also dependent uh, on the surface roughness uh, and it can occur in roller or ball bearings as well at low speeds or high loads um, for boundary lubrication, the coefficient of friction, typical values are 0.05 to 0.15. Typical values are about 0.1. Okay. So when we talk about bearings, uh, this is just an overview of some of the materials that are uh, available in bearings. And this is the table from Chapter 7 that talks about um, compatibility of metals, okay, identical metals here like if you have nickel here and you have nickel up here um, then these are uh, identical metals metals and you want to find metals that are uh, far away from each other so that they are not um, compatible you do not want metallurgically compatible material uh, metals um, and so you see here metallurgically compatible is this dot right here and if you go to aluminum you see that it is uh, metallurgically compatible or partially compatible with almost every other metal in this table okay and so that's why aluminum by itself uh, is almost never used for a bearing uh, surface or bearing material okay um, what we want in a material and a bearing is we want them to be relatively soft and we want them to be soft so that if there's some debris or foreign particles that they're absorbed by that soft uh, bearing material. We want them to have good lubricity, lubricity uh, and good temperature and corrosion resistance. And sometimes we want them to be porous. And so there's some centered bearing materials that are porous by nature and they can hold more uh, uh, lubricant, which is sometimes desirable for some applications. Okay. The bearing material should be about a third as hard as the material running against it. And that's another design rule of thumb. It kind of tells you the relative uh, hardness for the bearing material. And if it's uh, about a third, then the abrasive materials from that harder material can embed in the softer material. Okay, so if you get somewhere in the shaft, then the bearing surface can pick up that material and it can be embedded in there without really getting in the way of the motion. Okay, adhesive wear is a concern and materials should not be compatible. Okay, what that means is we shouldn't have them uh, being uh, metallurgically, uh, you know, able to d um, diffuse into the other material. Um, materials based on lead, tin, and copper are often used for this reason. And one of the oldest and most commonly used materials is babbitts or babbitt metal. Um, and historically these were made out of a uh, solid material and typically lead and tin mixed with other elements that can be electroplated uh, in thin films <laughs> and any fix this typo this should be that can that can be electroplated in thin not think films on other materials such as steel uh, Babbitt metal is used in crankshaft camshaft bearings and in inter internal combustion engine uh, they're soft, so they allow particles to be embedded in them. They have a low melting temperature, uh, but they do need lu good lubrication. Their hardness is usually 150 to 200 uh, Brunel hardness, and the surface finishes, uh, you typically want to be 0.25 to 0.3 microns. So if you go back to the previous slide where we said we wanted the surface roughness for elastor hydrodynamic lubrication is typically 1 micron, you can see here that the surface finish here is, is a third uh, smaller, so that's typically um, why we have these rules of thumbs. Then we have bronzes, which are copper alloys, um, that, and they're excellent for running against steel or cast iron. Uh, the Babbitt material is commonly mixed, uh, mated with steel. Um, bronzes are softer than ferrous materials. They have good strength, machinability, and corrosion resistance. Um, they can withstand boundary lubrication, okay? 
and support higher loads and temperatures than the Babbitts. Um, common uh, bronze alloys are copper, lead, leaded bronze, tin bronze, aluminum bronze, beryllium, copper, um, and, there's, and there's even more. Um, so their hardness um, is a little higher than I believe that of the Babbitt steel. Um, and then we have gray and cast iron steel, which is st also used in bearing material. And these are reasonable combinations, uh, the gray cast iron and steel materials at low velocity. Okay, so the cast iron would be used as the bearing material, and the free graphite in the cast iron adds lubricity, uh, but still requires a lubricant. Steel can be run against steel if both surfaces are hardened and lubricated, but this is um, um, not the design rule of thumb. Hardened steel balls and other rolling bearings are steel that runs against steel, but these are um, they're rolling um, and they're uh, hardened uh, to uh, high hardness values for the bearing applications. Then we have centered materials. Uh, these are porous materials that can soak up lubricant, and typically uh, centered bronze and steel are common combination. And then we have some non-metallic materials. In fact, there's uh, more and more that are coming available. There's a company called IGUS that has a whole range of uh, very, very impressive um, polymer products. Um, and they can run dry if the material itself has sufficient lubricity. And they can be con uh, considered at low loads and low temperatures. Um, graphite, nylon, acetyl, which is Delrin, the commercial name uh, filled Teflon, they lower uh, lower coefficients of friction. Um, and <clears throat> uh, some of the non-metallic polymers, they can actually, their strength can be increased with the addition of glass fiber, talc, uh, graphite, <clears throat> uh, molybdenum, disulfide powder uh, at the cost of a larger uh, coefficient of friction. So they can made, be made a little bit stronger with additives um, with the um, the cost of uh, a little bit higher friction. Uh, this is the hardness ratio of the shaft uh, uh, hardness to bearing uh, hardness if we have a shaft and bearing combination for different uh, materials uh, sliding against steel or cast iron. Okay, So this is kind of what you want as a hardness ratio and that's just this column divided by this column. Okay, so this is the, the shaft hardness that you would want as a rule of thumb if you're going to use this bearing material. So this is, this is a, an okay place to start with your design. Okay, and these are some of the materials that you can use for the bearing materials, and this is an old reference from 1957. Okay. <clears throat> Um, this uh, now we're going to talk about journal bearings and discuss some of the theory and how to go through the design process for journal bearings. So uh, this is a, a, a split journal bearing. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be split. You can have a, a sleeve bearing, sleeve journal bearing where the material goes all, all over. But typically you'd have a support layer. This would be like the structural uh, member. You'd have some uh, backing layer between the two, and then you'd have your bearing layer, which could be, um, you know, your Babbitt metal or whatever. And then you have uh, something uh, for the where the oil can be put in, and this is a guide for the oil to be distributed. This would be like on the top of this bearing uh, here, and this bearing would be bolted together. <clears throat> then you'd place a shaft in there, and then you just spin the shaft, and you get uh, the um, the uh, hydrodynamic lubrication. There's a link here to a video that's pretty interesting. It shows some of the bearings in service for machines. And these are used for an uh, awful lot of machines and it's pretty remarkable what, what uh, high pressures you can get from them. Okay, so this is some of the theory. Uh, we don't really have time to go into all the theory and take the um, Navier-Stokes equations um, and um, Reynolds equations and and go through them to where we finally derive the end equations but what we can do is still at least capture some of the relevant theoretical uh, um, features of how we understand and design these journal bearings okay 
So you can uh, think of a journal bearing like this, where we have uh, the bearing surface here, we have the lubricant here, and then we have the journal. And the journal is this portion of the shaft that is inside the bearing. Okay, this is concentric. This is a concentric journal bearing, so there's really no uh, transverse load. Um, this kind of just shows you the the geometry, and because the uh, diameter uh, to thickness uh, ratio is uh, so high, we can actually treat it like a moving plate uh, over a fixed plate with oil in between, uh, and that oil has a thickness H, and um, we can actually derive the shear stress that's experienced in that material here, and this says the shear stress of that oil is function, it's proportional to the viscosity um, times um, dB dt. Um, and we can uh, rearrange this uh, by expanding um, uh, the, um, by expressing uh, beta as dx dy, and then uh, expanding that here to rewrite this in terms of. Uh, this viscosity times du dy, and u is the velocity of the fluid. So if we take this little piece of fluid here and we zoom in, we have u, velocity u, that's the, the speed of the bottom part of that fluid element, and then up here we have u plus du, which is the velocity plus the differential change in velocity up here, and effectively all we really say is the velocity is zero down here, and the velocity up here is the same velocity as the plate. Uh, and in between, we have a linear relationship. If um, uh, the um, relationship is linear uh, from uh, he here to here for the fluid, and then we can say that, well, the forces on the fluid are just uh, the area of that element times the shear or we can rewrite that and say that the force is the viscosity times area times the speed of the moving plate, and that would be the speed of the bearing, which we would get from the RPM. We'd get the tangential velocity divided by the film thickness. Okay, so that's the required force to shear the element. And then we can relate that to the torque that's required to be applied to overcome that shear of that fluid. Uh, if it were just in this combination right here, okay? Um, this expression here was done by Petroff. It's called Petroff's equation, and that's the torque that's required to shear the fluid. So if we take the diameter over 2 times the force required to shear the fluid that's up here based upon the shear stress, which is a function of viscosity, and the area of the fluid that's in contact, <coughs> then we can rewrite this expression here uh, for the torque, which is just the radius, which is from here to here, okay, times the nest, times the area of that fluid, which is pi dl, that's the um, circumference times the length uh, of that fluid that's in contact with it, and that's the length of the, the journal, the part of the shaft that's in the fluid, okay. And so, and then we can find the speed. The linear speed is just going to be um, uh, pi d times n prime, and n prime is the rotational speed in revolutions per second of that shaft. So that allows us to get the tangential speed of that shaft, <coughs> and then we can relate it to the required torque. Okay, this is Petroff's equation, and it basically says that um, where if we have a shaft <coughs> that we want to overcome the uh, shear stress in the fluid, then the, the torque that we need to apply is given by this expression here, and that's how we derived it. Okay, We can um, express the, instead of having H here, we get rid of H, and we instead insert CD, which is the diametral clearance of the uh, fluid, and that's the H over 2, that's the height of the fluid over 2, um, and that tells us uh, what the, the clearance diameter is. Um,
for this uh, fluid so we can express this in terms of the uh, diametral clearance uh, here and that's half the height of the fluid okay um, and this is Petroff's equation and that's um, a way of finding what torque is required to overcome that shear in reality though uh, when we talk about journal bearings we actually um, are not just shearing the fluid but we need the fluid to uh, get up underneath the bearing and we need to pump that fluid underneath the bearing uh, so that we get this uh, bearing surface okay and it doesn't work if we have two flat plates and so um, what's required is that one of the plates uh, is at an angle and we have a minimum uh, fluid thickness and a maximum fluid thickness and the height of that fluid is a function of the distance along that fluid and we can model um, this uh, dynamic differently and if we have relative velocity then there's a pressure that develops between these two because of the way that the fluid is pumped in here and that's what we use for hydrodynamic lubrication in fact it was in the 1880s um, <clears throat> where uh, Beauchamp Tower experimented with railroad journal bearings and he found that the friction to be much much lower than he expected and he drilled a bunch of holes in the outside of the bearing and that uh, when he would spin it up to speed uh, the oil would just shoot out and so he uh, pl um, he plugged the uh, drilled holes and uh, any everything he put in there would be popped out so the forces the pressure was so much higher and the uh, friction was so much lower that um, uh, it was shocking and so uh, what he didn't know at the time is what was happening was this hydrodynamic lubrication and so as the journal spun it was actually pumping the fluid and creating very very high pressures um, and the mechanism that happens is, is when the journal starts to spin and actually it kind of climbs up the surface and moves over and then you have this difference between the center of the journal OJ and the center of the bearing and that difference is called the eccentricity and that parameter right there is what we use to um, uh, ex express and understand uh, how the journal bearing operates we'll see that in the next few slides um, and so Reynolds set about to try to capture these dynamics and put them in equation form and he was successful and we'll talk about that here in just a second after we discuss these terms okay so uh, when we talk about journal bearings we talk about uh, C, C sub D which is the diametral clearance which is the height of the fluid over 2 uh, we talked about OB, which is the bearing center, OJ, which is the center of the journal. The difference between these two is the eccentricity. Uh, CR is the radial clearance, okay, which is just CD over 2, which or would be H over 4. Um, then we have the eccentricity ratio, which is the eccentricity over the radial clearance. And this is kind of like uh, a percentage of the fluid height. Actually, you could express it like that. Uh, the height of the fluid for a journal bearing is approximately equal to the radial clearance times 1 plus the eccentricity ratio times the cosine of theta. And so at uh, theta, we, get, we usually take from theta from theta equals 0 to pi and then we try to get an expression for what the pressure is in here and what the film thickness is in here and the film thickness here is the minimum film thickness is from this equation and it's the radial clearance times 1 minus uh, the eccentricity ratio and then the max uh, h max over here at theta equals 0 this is theta equals pi at theta equals 0 we have the maximum height of the fluid and that's analogous to this picture that we have over here and that's given by uh, CR times 1 plus uh, the eccentricity ratio the clearance ratio is another uh, term that we use sometimes and that is just the diametral clearance over the diameter that's the clearance ratio 
Okay, so these are just a bunch of different geometrical uh, terms that go along with journal bearings, and we have to use them to uh, design. Um, obviously, the oil thickness is dramatically exaggerated in these pictures, so we can see what's going on. Um, but as the journal begins to spin and we get into the full film hydrodynamic lubrication regime, we have these other parameters that are features of the, the journal. Uh, we have the, this angle theta, okay? And this is the, the angle here between the line of eccentricity, which runs through the two centers, okay? And that's the line of the eccentricity um, all the way to the max pressure. P max, okay, so this is uh, the pressure profile of the film uh, here, and that pressure here has a vertical uh, uh, component of pressure that's described by phi, and that's relative to theta equals pi. So, okay, that's this angle that comes back uh, from theta equals pi, and that's where the pressure uh, P that acts to uh, hold up the load is experienced. And the reason that this is important is because usually we are talking about uh, putting a uh, transverse load here, a vertical load here. We need to know that we can develop uh, sufficient pressure and we need to know uh, where that is. Um, this is a side view of the journal bearing here. And this is a view of how the pressure profile, which is this guy, how it looks uh, when we uh, go along the shaft. Okay, so obviously the pressure is zero in the fluid here at the ends because it can leak out. Okay, and it's the max uh, here in the middle. And um, um, that's, how, that's how the pressure profiles are for uh, the axial uh, view and the side view of the, of the journal bearing. <clears throat> So um, Reynolds sought to uh, describe the phenomenon that was discovered by uh, Beauchamp, who drilled the holes in the side, and he came up with the Reynolds equation here. And this can be uh, derived from the Navier-Stokes equation. And this was uh, in the early 1900s, um, and, or late 1800s, I don't remember exactly, but um, they did not have uh, software that we have today. They didn't have... Uh, uh, FEA, and so they made some assumptions um, for uh, long bearings, which basically said that this uh, uh, gradient of pressure along the axis was effectively zero, and that's what you would get if you had a really, really long bearing. Um, you wouldn't see that uh, pressure gradient as a function of Z. What's the, what they're kind of saying here is like, well, imagine this is really, really long, okay, so you don't see these... Uh, uh, gradients at the end, which is reasonable for long bearing, bearings, and that allowed this equation, this Reynolds equation, to be solved. And it was Summerfield who solved this with an analytical solution that we could use in 1904, and we'll talk about that. We don't really use that, but it's interesting to kind of benchmark it. Uh, and then we came uh, uh, a little bit later to Ockwerk, and his solution accounts for the pressure losses at the edge of the journal bearing. And this is for shorter journal bearings, which are more, more commonly used uh, today. And it accounts for leakage based upon the length to diameter ratio of that uh, journal bearing, the length of the journal and to the diameter of the bearing. So we use this instead of the Summerfield for design. But if we want to compare them uh, to each other, uh, we took the Reynolds equations uh, the Summerfield took the Reynolds equation and said that this gradient dp dz was zero and then came up with this expression for the pressure uh, distribution um, as a function of the angle. And we'll see some other things, uh, some other uh, expressions, uh, plus some p naught. This is if you're pumping some pressure in, so you have some hydrostatic pressure in the bearing. Uh, and then the total load was just... Uh, this um, uh, uh, pressure uh, over the uh, um, overall uh, bearing here. And then we had the average pressure uh, here, which is just the uh, pressure uh, on the uh, shaft times the uh, over the area, and the area in this case was the uh, 
uh, length times the diameter of the shaft. And uh, Sommerfeld came up with this Sommerfeld number, which uh, could be related to the, the load of the, the bearing. Okay, so higher numbers could take higher loads. Um, and they had um, other, other features uh, that we don't really use, and so we won't confuse the matter by talking too much about it. Instead, we use the Ockwerk equation, which also started with the Reynolds equation. But he int introduced this term here, which accounts for some pressure losses at the end. Um, and so this is the pressure distribution as a function of the angle around the journal. Uh, he had came up with this expression for the total load then in terms of this uh, k sub epsilon. And this k sub epsilon is a function of uh, the... Um, um, the ratio, the, the, the uh, eccentricity ratio, epsilon here. Um, and this is just the speed uh, u of that fluid, which is just pi d times the revolutions per second, okay? To convert to the, the linear speed of the bearing uh, in journal surface. Um, and then uh, he combined these to come up with what is called the uh, Ockwerk uh, number. I mix the I and the R here, the Ockwerk number, and it's in terms of 4 pi times this dimensionless parameter, which is based upon this eccentricity ratio. So based upon the eccentricity ratio, uh, we can find this uh, Ockwerk number, and we'll show so how we use that shortly. Okay, this is... Um, uh, comparing the Summerfield equation and the Ockwerk uh, equations, and uh, it's normalized based upon the Summerfield solution. Okay, um, so Summerfield solution assumed a long bearing, and this was the pressure uh, profile that he found in the journal bearing as a function of the angle around the bearing. And when uh, this is the Ockwerk solution for different length over diameter ratios, and you can see that when you have a, uh, a length to diameter ratio of 0.25, you actually have uh, significantly less pressure to be able to hold up the bearing. And that's what's important about this. So um, Ockwerk was uh, able to um, add that and give us a way of finding out um, how much pressure we could um, sustain in the bearing based upon different length to diameter ratios. Okay. When we talk about uh, journal bearings, there's torque and power losses. Uh, and uh, for the, the stationary and rotating bearings, and this um, occurs because there's actually a, a, a couple that's uh, present by these pressures that can be uh, these loads, these load P that are off center. They cause a moment uh, to be applied. And we can account for that, the difference between the uh, stationary and uh, rotating torques uh, by multiplying that uh, load times the eccentricity times the sine of uh, phi. And phi is where this location of this max uh, uh, pressure is uh, located at, at, a, at a point load. Okay. Um, and then we can create a ratio of these uh, uh, stationary torques to the nominal shear torque to shear the fluid. And we can look at the power losses uh, between the two. Usually these are really, really small numbers, um, but they are present. And it is, uh, it is a loss in the system. And usually we treat uh, the um, bearing as having zero speed or zero velocity, so that one of these is typically zero if they're not rotating relative to one another. Although there may be some applications where they are, it's not the typical application. And based upon these forces, um, we can find the friction uh, of, of that's present between the two, okay? And then we have the friction force uh, here, which is gonna be the torque for the rotating component over the radius um, divided by the normal force, which is that pressure that's uh, here on that object. And we can express that uh, here and get, a, get an expression for the actual friction in that fluid. Okay. So the question that we 
uh, have to ask then is how do we uh, design hydrodynamic bearings? And um, although I won't claim to make you a hydrodynamic bearing designer in this class, uh, I think it's important enough to talk about and to get us to where we can get close to some numbers or at least ask the right questions to people to uh, select them. So in an application, what we do know is we usually will know the load uh, that the bearing has to support, some applied load. And we uh, often will know the speed or some access acceptable speed range. We may actually know how those loads are distributed in the, that shaft and what the deflections are. Obviously, we have to make sure that the deflections are uh, small enough to where they don't deflect the shaft into the, the bearing. <clears throat> Um, and so that'll kind of inform how big the shaft will need to be uh, or some other geometrical considerations of that design. So our task is then, you know, how do we design, uh, you know, the bearing diameter uh, with the right length and suitable viscosity lubricant uh, by being with, you know, still being reasonable to manufacture. Uh, <clears throat> we also have to make sure that the design has a reasonable clearance and eccentricity ratio uh, so that we prevent contact. So we never want it to um, have contact or, or under its nominal load or if it's overloaded. And so we'll have, you know, same concept of safety factor here where we can take uh, max pressure um, and we don't want it to um, bottom out if it's, you know, overloaded. Um, this shows the relationship between the eccentricity ratio um, and the Ockford uh, number, okay? So this is the uh, equations that uh, we get for the uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me Ockford number based upon the eccentricity ratio from uh, the equations that uh, were derived. And these are the theoretical values, and they underestimate um the um actual values these uh dots here are experimental values okay um these up here are when you have misalignment and some elastic deflection okay um and this is sort of like the limiting eccentricity ratio this is like the highest eccentricity ratio and this is the theoretical eccentricity ratio and these are based upon the uh Ockwork numbers which we can um, calculate from the parameters of the design uh, or the eccentricity ratio, okay? Um, keep in mind uh, that these are the experimental values here, so we can use this equation for the experimental values for the eccentricity ratio. Uh, once we have that, we can estimate the film thicknesses, the min and max film thicknesses, just from the eccentricity ratio uh, and the radial clearance. Okay, um, larger length to diameter ratios give lower film pressures, okay? The clearance ratio is the diametral clearance over the diameter and the typical values are 0.001 to 0.002. Larger clearance ratios increase the load number. The load number, the OVNIC number, I'm sorry, the OVNIC number is also called the load number and the larger the clearance ratios, they increase the uh, load number as a function of the clearance ratio squared. Um, some values that are recommended uh, by the author that's referenced in your book is to start with load factor or load number or Ockwork number of 30 for moderate loading. That gives you an eccentricity ratio of 0.82 or uh, 60 for heavy loading, eccentricity ratio of 0.9 or 90 for severe loading, eccentricity ratio of 0.93. And there's trade-offs between these two. So in general, we want to stay below uh, 30. Larger load numbers give larger eccentricity, which relates to larger pressures and larger torques, which you can see here, okay? So these are the uh, ratios of the max pressure to average pressure, stationary torque to nominal torque, and these are your theoretical and experimental values. And you can see the higher the Ockford number, that the more the higher these ratios go up. Okay. <clears throat> and so the, these are a function also of the eccentricity ratio. Also here is the, the angle 
uh, for, I think, the um, pressure uh, uh, location, the max pressure location, you can see that the higher the number, the further along the, the angle goes for um, theta max and for phi. All right. So what? How do we put all this together? Well, really, kind of is a is an art of using what you know and then trying to find out what you uh, need to know, like many of the design problems that we've seen so far. And so one of the best ways to do that is through the examples that we have. And this is an example from the book. And this is the um, an application where we have roller bearings here. Uh, we have a bunch of the geometry that's defined for this particular machine. And uh, there's a desire to have a sleeve bearing, okay, which is a journal bearing, to replace the rolling element bearings at the shaft shown, okay. So this is a figure from a previous uh, example problem where the bearings were select, where we have bearings, roller bearings, here they're shown here, and we'd like to replace them with um, sleeve bearings. Um, <clears throat> this is from example uh, 10.1. It may be different. This is, I think, the fourth edition of the book that I've taken this image from, so you'd probably want to reference it in the version of the book that you have. Um, we're told that the max transverse loads on the shaft at the bearings are 16 pounds at R1 and 54 pounds at R2. Okay, R1 is here. These are the reaction loads. So obviously we'd have to uh, account, I mean, um, have at least uh, 54 pounds of pressure develop in the journal bearing so it doesn't bottom out. Uh, we're told the shaft diameters at R1 and R2 are both uh, 0.5 non-1 inches and that the shaft speed is 1,725 RPMs. Bearings are stationary, so we don't have relative velocity between the journal and the, um, the bearing. Uh, use a clearance ratio of 0.0017. And that, I believe, is what's the diametral clearance over the diameter. That's the clearance ratio. Uh, and a length over diameter ratio of 0.75. Uh, the uh, Ockwork equation is good up to 2. Uh, it's pretty accurate for length to diameter ratios up to 2. So this is well within the range of where we could design. Uh, keep the Ockwork number at 30 or below, preferably around 20. So that kind of tells us where we can start to design, if we know that our Ockwork number is around 20, we can find the eccentricity ratio and then use that in some of the other equations. Um, find the bearing eccentricity ratio, maximum pressure in its location. Okay, so we want the, they want us to know the angle of where that's acting. Minimum film thickness. Okay, so that's H min, and that's a function of the eccentricity ratio and the uh, radial clearance. Uh, the coefficient of friction. Okay, so we can find that from the, the torques, the torque, power lost, and the bearing. Okay, so, th you know, you may look at all this and be a little bit confused as where to start. Well, we just got to start with uh, what we know. So, first of all, let's take the speed and get the tangential velocity. Okay, so we have 1,725 revolutions per minute. There's a minute in every 60 seconds. There's 60 seconds in every minute. So that gives us 28.75 revolutions per second. And then we can multiply uh, that times the diameter to get inches per second times pi so that we can get uh, there's pi uh, radians per revolution. So we can get this in um, <clears throat> uh, inches per second. Okay, so that's 53.38 inches per second, and that's the velocity of that uh, um, outer surface of the uh, journal here that we need for those fluid equations. Um, we're told that the clearance ratio is 0. Uh, 0.0017. Uh, so we can multiply that by the diameter of the shaft to get our diametral clearance. And that's 0. 0.0010. Then we can get our radial clearance, which is just half of that. Okay, so that's 5 uh, tenth five ten thousandths and then the bearing length is found from the assumed length to diameter ratio well we're told what the diameter is it's 0.5471 so then we can find the journal length the length of the 
journal in, in the bearing, and that's going to be 0.75. So it's 0.443, so it's about half an inch. So it's pretty interesting to think about, like the <clears throat> diameter is uh, almost 0.6 inches, and the, uh, b the bearing uh, surface is less than half of an inch for the journal bearing. Uh, find the experimental eccentricity ratio from equation 11.13. This is probably it may be different in your book. Actually, I think it's the same. Or from the figure, okay, using the suggested value of um, the uh, Ockverk number of 20. So we can plug in the Ockverk number into the experimental uh, fit of that data, okay, or, or into the equation. If we plug it into the uh, fit of the data, we find that it's 0.747. Uh, we'd find a similar number if we used um, the theoretical value, but we said that it would underestimate it. So you could either go to the figure, and the figure that we're talking about is this figure here, where you're given your octric number of 20. You can go find your eccentricity ratio here. Um, so this is your experimental curve. So they're picking this one here. Okay, so that's where that value comes from <coughs> of uh, 0.747. Um, now we have enough information to get the dimensionless parameter, which is k sub e, and that's what it's called. It's just a dimensionless parameter for that uh, equation. And it's just going to be 20 over 4 pi, which gives us 1.592. And um, we can use what we have now. Uh, we have the load. We have the diametral I mean the radial clearance, we have the dimensionless coefficient, we have the uh, tangential speed, and we have the length of the journal bearing. So we have enough information to calculate the viscosity, okay? And so we can plug these in and we can find that the viscosity is 1.825 micro -ren. Um And based upon these values, we can uh, go to figure 11.1 uh, uh, to find an oil um, that uh, this ISO VG100 that gives us uh, this value at 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is where it can be a little bit frustrating because if you don't have that information, it says choose a lubricant to operate at 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is information that we really don't cover how to get this number, but we'd have to kind of figure out, uh, you know, like what, what, um, how much friction is going to be put in there? How do we calculate the temperature? And there's references for that. We just don't go over that. So this is a given value here. But this is a value if you were actually going through design yourself, uh, you'd have to actually calculate or find um, by taking a little bit deeper dive than we go here. I'm just trying to highlight the caveats uh, for you as we go through this. Okay. Uh, that's essentially a SAE 30 weight uh, engine oil. Okay, so you can uh, use that as well. Uh, you can just pick that up off the graph. So either one of these two. Um, and then once we have the load and we have the length, the journal length and the diameter, we can get the average uh, uh, pressure here, which is the force over the area, which is 206 psi. So that's the oil that's going to be in the film based upon that um uh Ockwork number of 20 okay and that l over d ratio okay at that speed so we we got all of that from those parameters um the angle so they want us to also find the uh angle The maximum pressure in its location. So they're asking for the angle. So theta max is the location of the max pressure. Okay, so we can just plug in the eccentricity ratio into this equation and find out that theta max is 159.2. Okay, uh, there's the other way that we could get this. Like you can read it from the experimental curve uh, from that figure um, from the eccentricity, uh, or I mean from uh, that if we go uh, back. I can show you, I believe it's this one um, here, where we find uh, L over 2 of 0.75. Here is right here about, you know, just under 160, okay? So that's what we find as well. All right, 
So now that we have those numbers, we can calculate the maximum pressure by plugging in theta max into the equation for the uh, uh, P max. Okay, so um, we plug Z equals zero. That just means that instead of us being at the ends, we want the pressure right there in the middle of the journal bearing. So we just say Z is zero. That's where it is there and then we can find that that max pressure at that angle theta max is 1878 psi um, or the pressure ratio p max over p average can be read from the experimental curve uh, for on of 20 okay as 9.1 multiplied by p average and that gives us about the same result okay so what that's saying is that from these graphs here where we have p max over p average this is the experimental values for an OVNIC number of 12. Um, experimental, sorry, P max, uh, P max over P average. For the OCFERC uh, number of 20, we'd come up here and be almost 10, just under 10. So if we calculated the average pressure, we can calculate the max pressure from uh, this graph here. Okay, but instead we uh, used the equations. But those tables, I believe, were, you know, drive, uh, or th those, those, uh, Tables have the experimental data, okay? Or we can use the equation here. All right? So here we say um, find the angle phi, uh, which locates the theta equals zero to pi axis with respect to the applied load P from the equation there. So we plug in the eccentricity ratio and we can get our angle phi of 34.95 degrees. And um, once we have that, we can actually calculate the stationary and rotating torques, okay, because this parameter phi shows up here for that, uh, those torque equations. So we plug those values in. The speed of the uh, bearing is zero, so we make that zero. Plug in the uh, viscosity that we calculated, the diameter cubed, the speed, uh, the, I mean the length of the bearing, the speed, and make sure we we go is make sure our units are okay. The diametral clearance times pi over uh, this expression down here with the eccentricity ratio, and we can calculate that TS is 0.0713 inch pounds, which is pretty low. And then using that expression, we can find um, <clears throat> uh, TR. Okay, and then we get TS and TR, and so that we can calculate the power losses uh, from those from TR, and the power loss here is 0.002 horsepower, which is uh, pretty low, um, but it's still um, a loss in power that we can um, account for. Once we have um, the um, rotating torque. Um, the and the um, pressure, um, and then uh, we can calculate the uh, coefficient of friction, uh, the effective coefficient of friction in the bearing uh, from that shear uh, force to the normal force, uh, and we find that in this case it is 0 0.005, which is uh, nice and low. Uh, then we can find the minimum film thickness from the radial uh, clearance and the eccentricity ratio uh, from the equation that we had earlier. It's 126 micro inches, which is really small. Um, but, uh, and then what we have to concern ourselves with is make sure that this value, 126 micro inches, is larger than the roughness of that material. Okay? So this is a reasonable value since the composite RMS, that's the root mean square surface roughness, the RMS surface roughness, okay, which is in the surfaces chapter, it needs to be no more than about a third to the fourth of the minimum film thickness to avoid asperity contact. And that's where the roughness of the surface of the journal contacts the bearing. It turns out uh, that a 30 to 40 micro inches RQ finish or better is easily obtainable by uh, precision milling, uh, grinding, or honing, but we would just have to make sure that those, um, that the bearing 
um, and uh, journal shafts have uh, uh, been polished if necessary or that we know at least what the uh, surface roughness is so that that surface roughness is not greater than a third of the film, the minimum film thickness, okay? Um, a safety factor against disparity contact can be estimated by back solving the model using a minimum film thickness equal to the assumed average surface finish of say 40 micro inches and determining what Ockwerk number and load P would be required to reduce the minimum oil thickness to that value. Okay, this was easily done in the model by switching H min and eta to put it to input status P and O N to output status, providing a gas value for the uh, Ockwerk number and iterating to a solution. Okay, so if we do that, <clears throat> instead of calculating what the minimum thickness is, we basically say, well, let's say our minimum film thickness is uh, uh, 40 microns, which is would be the limit uh, of the, you know right there at the surface finish, and then back calculate what numbers we would need to have. Then you can calculate the um, the load numbers, and so in this case, um, this gives us a, a P of 195 pounds over 54 pounds, um, and that gives us enough. Uh, safety factor of about 3.6, which takes care of overloads. Okay. If this safety factor calculation had indicated that a small overload could be put could put the bearing in trouble, then we had to redesign it, and we'd have to redesign the bearing for a lower Ockwerk number, and that would give us more margin against failure under overloads. Okay. So in that case. Uh, we'd have to repeat it to get a reduced um, number for that. So then we'd have to decrease the clearance ratio, decrease the length to diameter ratio, or increase the viscosity of the oil. Okay, so this example is kind of meant to show you the example, but a lot of things can go wrong if uh, we don't have the parameters right. Okay. So assuming everything is, else is constant, the bearing length could also be increased um, to have uh, more um, of the um, journal in the bearing. Or we can increase the di diametral clearance, okay, as well as um, uh, increasing the absolute viscosity to improve the, the design, okay? So that is an overview of bearings, some of the materials, some of the lubrications, and some of the background theory for journal bearings, along with uh, an example of uh, going through the design of a journal bearing. Uh, this is by no means complete. We haven't touched on temperature. We haven't gone into the details of how you select a lubricant. There's a lot of things that are um, left out. Um, but this should give you a starting point to design um, or get into close, close to reasonable numbers for geometry and then get a little bit additional support with some specific resources for uh, designing these types of applications. Uh, that's all I have for now. And if you have any questions, please, uh, by all means, uh, let me know.